Welcome to Coiny Corner. Uh, I'd like to ask up front today, if you're enjoying these videos and finding any value in them, please subscribe, share, like, uh, pass them on to a friend who may also have an interest in the New Testament. Today we're looking at a powerhouse little package of two verses, and most of what we're going to look at is in just one verse today. It's in Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. And verse 7 is a rich and glorious menu for us to feast from. So um, we're going to take, it's, it's got three parts in verse 7. We're going to take each part by itself, and then we'll put them all together. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. And verse 7 begins with this phrase in Koine, me planaste, me planaste. So me is no or not. And planaste is this magnificent imperative that we're looking at. We la I believe last week we talked about imperatives. Imperatives are commands. And uh, so when you put the may in front of the command, you're telling someone to not do something. So planaste is present, <coughs> pardon me, present, passive, imperative, second person plural. And it means to, um, to be misled or to be deceived. So, me planaste, do not be misled, do not be deceived. Um, and because it's a present imperative, not an aorist imperative, he's saying do not continually be misled or deceived. This is a fantastic little two-word phrase that has so much to talk about. So, Paul, the apostle, is not just a genius and a scholar, he's a man of his times. And one of the prevailing uh, philosophical schools of the day in the first century was Stoicism. And me planaste is a Stoic motto. If you are going to have a bumper sticker on the back of your donkey to let people know that you are a Stoic, it very well may say me planaste. But here's the thing, it always had something that followed. So it was always, uh, do not be misled or do not be deceived, and then there would be an example of deception or being misled so that you would know. Like, you know, do not be, do not be misled. Uh, your feelings aren't as important as reality. Uh, do not be misled. Um, you can only be hurt if you allow yourself to be hurt. Stoicism, right? Um, so let's talk about the word itself, planaste. We've already parsed it, that it's a present imperative, present passive imperative. But the root of the word is the same root we get our English word planet from. Um, why? Because early, early uses of this word were geographical in nature. When, when he says, do not be misled, it used to literally mean, don't, uh, don't allow yourself to, to be taken on a bad path somewhere. You're not going to wind up where you think you're going. It, it had to do with navigation. And you can navigate at night using the stars as guides, right? Um, but planets are tempting to use for navigation because they tend to be very bright in, comp in comparison with stars. Their problem is, unlike stars, they don't have a fixed point in relation to the, to the stars. They wander. They move around. So if you start navigating based on a planet, you will be misled. You will be led in a bad way. You will be deceived. You'll think you're going one way when you're not. So me planaste, stoic motto, uh, rooted in the notion that you don't want to be misled. You don't want to find yourself going in a bad direction because you're following something untrustworthy. A lot, of a lot of stuff packed in those two little words. So do not be continually misled or deceived is the first part of verse 7. Let's look at the second part. Theus u mukterizetai. Theus u mukterizetai. So theos is God, right? Theos, everybody knows that one. Uh, u is not or no. And uh, mukterizetai is the verb in the second clause. What is mukterizetai? Well, to parse it, it's a present act, uh, passive indicative, third person singular, and your mukter is your nose. So mukterizetai, if we look back at very old uses of it, um, in secular Greek, 
outside the New Testament, outside any spiritual context, outside any figurative uh, use of the word, it used to be translated nosebleed. So, mukterizo, I have a nosebleed. What was the first thing that an adult told you as a kid when you found yourself with a nosebleed? What did they tell you to do? Right? Tip, tip your head back. In other, another way of saying tip your head back is put your nose up. Put your nose up. So, mukterizatai means <clears throat> uh, he has his nose up. He, you know, he has a nosebleed secularly, but uh, we translate it um, here, God is not mocked. Because when you mock someone, when you make little of someone, you sort of turn your nose up at them, right? Like you dismiss them with an upturned nose. Um, another powerful little nugget there. So let's put the two pieces together. Because remember, me planaste as a Stoic motto always had something that came after it to give you an example of what would be misleading. Me planaste, theos u mukterizetai, God is not continually mocked. So you, God is not, you know, you, you can't think that you're mocking God, that you're turning your nose up at God without actually being deceived or misled. If you think you can turn your nose up at God and go your own way and do your own thing, you're, you're being misled, you are being deceived, is what Paul tells us. Pretty powerful stuff. Um, now, let's get to the third part of verse 7. Hogar eon spere anthropos, tuto kai therise. So, hogar eon spere anthropos, hogar for that which, whatever, heon spere anthropos, a man might sow, not sow with a needle, but sow as in farming, sowing crops, for whatever a man might sow, uh, tuto, this or this thing, kai also therese, he shall in the future, uh, future active indicative, third person singular, he shall sow, or he, I mean, he shall reap, he shall harvest. So, so to put it all together, for whatever a man might sow, whatever, it doesn't matter to Paul what you sow, he doesn't care if it's carrots or corn, but he says, whatever you choose to sow, just understand that that's the thing that you will reap in the future. What you plant today is what you will reap in the future, because that's the way it works. Right, so he tells he tells the Galatians that the nature of a person's sowing determines the nature of the person's reaping. He or she will reap whatever it is that he or she sows. So, and if you don't get this, I'm I'm expanding on Paul's thought. If you don't get this, you'll be deceiving yourself. How or why? by turning your nose up at God and or God's created order, um, the, the way things work. Um, so how so? Well, let's take a look at it. If you, plant, if you plant carrots with the expectation in your mind that you're going to harvest corn from those planted carrots, um, what do you think you're in for? You're definitely in for a disappointment, right? You're in for a rude awakening when you go out to harvest corn and the only thing that you find is carrots. You will, you will learn that you have, in fact, um, been misled. You've been deceived by this thought that you could plant carrots and harvest corn. And along with that, if we think of carrots and corn as a part of the creation, as a part of the created order, um, if you insist on planting carrots with the purpose of harvesting corn, you're kind of turning your nose up at the God who created both carrots and corn. Because I'm going to tell you something, and to do so, I'm going to invoke the vernacular. I'm going to use a word that we're told never to use. Don't worry, it's nothing uh, ugly. It may be ugly to you if you're a grammarian. Um, but here's the, here's the truth that's almost inescapable. Corn ain't carrots, and carrots ain't corn. So if you're planting carrots with the expectation of harvesting corn, you are in fact deceiving yourself. 
you're being misled, you're going in a direction that's not going to lead you where you want to go, and you're kind of making a mockery of the created order and therefore the creator of the order. Corn ain't carrots, carrots ain't corn. Um, if you tell yourself that you can do this, if you insist that you can do this, you're engaging in self-deception, you're fooling yourself, and you're also sort of saying that uh, you get to determine what the order of things are. Um, God doesn't make that order, you make that order. Now, I want to diverge a little bit from the text and talk about modern culture. Culture is a cyclical thing. Uh, every three or four hundred years, Gnosticism raises its ugly head. And part of Gnosticism is this notion of secret, special knowledge that only you have. The normies, the regular people, they don't know the things that you know. You have insights into things that other people just don't have. And we can see in Gnosticism people who argue that uh, the, the created order, that nature, that ontology, the, the nature of being isn't what it is, it's what they feel it is. Listen, in my heart of hearts, in the deepest fibers of my being, I believe I can plant these carrots and at the end of the season, when I come to harvest, I'll be able to harvest corn. You don't believe it. You don't understand it. But I believe in my deepest heart of hearts that I can plant carrots and harvest corn. Well, you may need to rely rather on your heart of hearts, on your brain of brains, and on uh, the millennia of experience that humans have. And you may even need to take a journey to your laboratory of laboratories and come to the conclusion empirically and, uh, and epistemologically that corn ain't carrots and carrots ain't corn. So it doesn't matter how sincerely I feel it or hope it or wish it or want it. If I plant carrots, I am not going to harvest from those planted carrots corn because that's just not how it works, no matter how I feel. Uh, Gnosticism rears its ugly head and tells people that they have a special knowledge about things and things are uh, something other than what uh, ontology tells us they are. So let's carry on. Uh, what we know for certain from verse 7 is that um, whatever it is that you choose to plant, that's the thing that you're going to harvest. So let's go back through that real quickly. Me planaste, the Stoic slogan, uh, do not be deceived or misled. Theos u mukteridzetai, God is not continually being mocked. That's not, that's not a thing. Hogar eon spere anthropos, for whatever a man might sow or, or plant in the ground, tutokai therese, uh, this also shall he reap. The thing that he plants is the thing that he's going to reap. That's the created order of things. That's how things are ordained. To think that it works otherwise is to mock God and show that you are self-deceived or misled. Um, let's get to the application. In uh, verse 8, Hoti ho speron es tein sarka heautu, ecte sarkos therese, this is a hard word to pronounce, thoran. So, Hoti ho speron, because the one who sows, it's a present participle, the one who's a continual sower, the one who sows, Ace tain sarcane uh, tain sarca heautu into his own flesh into his heart of hearts. The, make the metaphor back to our uh, corn analogy and our carrot analogy. The one who continually sows into his own flesh into his heart of hearts. Uh, out of that flesh, he shall harvest. He shall reap. And then there's that tricky word to pronounce, thoran, uh, corruption. So if you think that your farming can be all about 
sowing into your own flesh, into your own heart of hearts, your own understanding, your own desire, your own uh, determined order of things, when it comes harvest time, you're going to get neither corn nor carrots, uh, you're going to get corruption. Uh, pretty, pretty strong stuff. Uh, the one, because the one who sows into his own flesh will reap from that flesh corruption. Let's look at the second half of verse 8. Hode speron ace to numa ek to numatos therese zoen ionion. So, in a parallel construction to the previous half of the verse, but the one who sows, Hode uh, speron, the one who sows, ace to numa into the spirit, ek to numatos, out of the spirit, therese, same verb from the previous part, he shall harvest or he shall reap zoane life ionion, life eternal. So the one who sows into the spirit out of the spirit shall reap life eternal. If you choose self-deception and God mocking, if you choose sowing into the flesh, if you choose sowing based on your heart of hearts, um, the harvest is corruption, neither carrots nor corn. But if you are undeceived, and if you accept and acknowledge the created order of things, if you sow in the spirit, if you do things God's way and not your own way, your harvest is, uh, you'll wind up where you want to go. You'll harvest good things, not just life, but abundant life, life eternal. It's pretty powerful stuff, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty wild. All of this goes back to the original Edenic question. What do I mean by that? Adam and Eve are in the garden. You can have everything you want, eat all you want, live it up. Uh, we're in a covenant with one another. Uh, God says to Adam and Eve, I'm only asking you one thing, live it up, eat all you want, but leave that one tree alone. It's the sign of our covenant. It's the sign of your yieldedness to me, your recognition that I am God and you are man, that I am creator and you are creation, that you accept my place in the covenant as the king, the suzerain, and yourselves as the vassals that you yield and submit to me in the covenant. If you eat from that tree, you're saying that God's not God, but you are God, and you're breaking the covenant, you're going your own way, you're going to follow your heart of hearts and the words of the talking snake, and <clears throat> things won't be, you won't wind up where you thought you were going to be. It won't be life eternal. Uh, in fact, it'll be corruption, destruction, and death. The day you eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. So the big, Eden, the big Edenic question, who will be God in this situation? Will God be God or will I be God? And Paul, conveying that to his Galatian audience, made up largely of Gentile Christians who know about Stoicism, employs the Stoic motto, right? Me planas, they don't follow a wandering star. You'll be misled. You'll be deceived. You'll find yourself thinking that you can mock God, turn up your nose and follow your heart of hearts. Next thing you know, you'll think you can plant carrots and harvest corn, but make no mistake, whatever you choose to plant, that's what you're going to harvest. And then he gives them the great example. If you harvest according to the flesh, if you harvest into your own flesh, if you follow your heart of hearts, you're not going to wind up where you want to be. You're going to wind up with corruption. But if you, har if you sow into the spirit, pardon me, I kept saying harvest when I meant sow earlier. If you sow into the spirit, from that spirit, you're going to reap a magnificent and abundant harvest, not just life, life eternal. You'll have Edenic garden-like harvest, abundance forever in relationship, in a yielded covenant relationship to the God who created both carrots, corn, and you. Magnificent stuff, powerful stuff. If you want to have some real fun, go after we're done today, go and read the next two verses, verses 9 and 10 in Galatians 6, and look at how Paul continues to flesh out the concept in a practical manner in the way you live with other people. So don't fool yourself. Um, God is not going to be perpetually and continually mocked. Can't turn up your nose. Can't fake a nosebleed. Doesn't matter what's in your heart of hearts and how much you believe that uh, 
corn can be carrots and carrots can be corn. Um, sow in your life with a vision of what you hope to harvest. If you don't want to harvest corruption, don't sow into your heart of hearts. Uh, sow into God's spirit. Uh, if you want to harvest life that's eternal, uh, recognize the one who creates life and grants life and not just life for a little while, but abundant life eternally. Paul was a genius. Paul utilized the terminology and the phrases and the popular philosophy of his day to communicate a Christian message rooted in the Judeo-Christian tradition all the way back uh, to the beginning uh, with this agrarian model um, so that his hearers could understand that if they want abundant life, they can't fool themselves and go following wandering stars, which are not stars at all, but are planets. Um, they have to let God be God and that let themselves be humans and uh, eventually reap good things that they've sown uh, because you're going to reap what you sow, whatever you choose to sow. Thanks for being with me today in Coin A Corner. This was great for me. I hope it was good for you. Until we see each other again, Karis Kaya Rene Humine, grace and peace to you.